Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're here for our webinar. Welcome to the Science of Reading 2.0, A Deeper Understanding, which will be presented by Jan Hasbrook today. Um, this is a full circle moment for Read Washington because about three years ago, we started our organization and had our first event, which was the Science of Reading. We work very hard to offer low cost or no cost information or webinars for people. We are an official 501c3 organization and Jan is gonna show you our mission. We are a nonprofit organization established to provide professional development opportunities based on the science of reading so that every child will become a skilled and confident reader. And we know that the unnecessary pain of reading failure can be prevented. So here we are, here are the founding board members. My name is Julie Bedell. I've been teaching for lots and lots of years, both as a reading specialist, and I'm currently a classroom teacher for Seattle Public Schools. Amy Fleischer is also a teacher for Seattle Public Schools and helps us so much with all the details of these webinars and beyond, of course. But Amy and I, luckily, I'm so lucky I get to teach with her. Mm -hmm. um, Frank Greif is comes to us from the corporate world and the world of communications, and he keeps our organization healthy and moving forward. And then, of course, we're all here to hear Dr. Jan Hasbrook, and she's going to get her own introduction in just a minute by Amy. Laura Cooper is also a founding member. I hope Laura is on today. She currently lives and teaches children in Michigan. We miss Laura. A little bit of housekeeping before we get going so you know what to expect. We're going to get started real soon here with a presentation from Jan, which will go to around 1130. We'll then take uh, questions uh, from people who put them in the question and answer box, not the chat. Use the chat to talk to each other, but please put specific questions you, you would like Jan to answer in the, the Q&A box. We'll try to get her to answer as many questions as possible. All the links, the certificate of attendance, the slides for today's event are going to be posted in chat, but you're going to also find everything at readwa.org. Everything will be on our website. If you're here, you registered in about a week or so, you will get a recording of the event. Um, Amy, did I leave anything out? No, I think you got it all. And when, all we, right. when we put a link in the chat for all the documents and Jan's presentation, the link will just say readwa.org because everything is hosted there. So you just need that one link, like Julie said. No, I think that's great. It's my turn now to present Jan Hasbrook, Dr. Jan Hasbrook, who um, it's such an honor and a privilege to know her and work with her. And uh, undoubtedly our incredible turnout is due to the fact that Jan um, has such wisdom to share with us. Jan started her science of reading journey, um, spending 15 years in the classroom as both a reading specialist and an instructional coach before moving on to become a globally recognized researcher, educational consultant, and author. I'm sure like me, you've got a bookshelf filled with a bunch of Dr. Hasbrook books. <laughs> She's published books on uh, curriculum and curriculum materials, assessment tools. She has completed research in reading fluency, academic assessments, interventions, and all of that research has been widely published. And she continues to collaborate with researchers all while she is working with schools both across the country and internationally. And when she's not filling all of our hearts and minds with the science of reading, she is spending time volunteering in her grandson's K-8 school in Seattle. So we are so fortunate to hear from Jan today and to have her be a part of Read Washington. Well, thank yeah. you, Julie. Thank you, Amy. Uh, yeah, let's get this show on the road. So happy that you're with us. Those of you who are with us live, 
from literally all over the world, Ghana and India and Honduras and Dubai and many other places. And those of us, those of you who will watch the recording of this, that's uh, wonderful to, for us to explore together what we're calling the science of reading 2.0. So for this hour and a half or so that we have together, um, I have some goals for, as I was creating this presentation, I was thinking of the vast audience of, in many cases, a highly educated, deeply experienced educators. Um, so thinking about what the goals would be, and some who may just be starting on this uh, journey of learning about the science of reading. You're all welcome. And I know that we we jump into this process wherever we are. But uh, one of the things that I've been doing the last couple of years, many of us have switched how we're learning and uh, accessing information. I've been so lucky to attend uh, several webinars by my good friend and colleague, Anita Archer. And in one of the webinars she did, it may have been the one that she did for Read Washington, she shared these goals um, that she hoped that her webinar would, for some, affirm information that you already knew. And it would be to affirm, to confirm that you're on the right track, that what you know is correct. Um, and that's a valuable reason to attend a webinar. She also said that one of her goals um, and it is mine as well, to perhaps remind you of some information that you knew at some point, you learned at some point, you read about maybe, but you haven't thought about for a while, and this will help bring it back to the fore. Um, and the third goal is to uh, hopefully extend your information, connect you to some new resources, think about some things in perhaps a different way. Um, that's always a good goal. Um, when we are on this journey for learning. I'm going to spend a moment also talking about some possible conflicts of interest. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I'm doing this in part because it's always a good thing to do for a, a professional when they're sharing information um, so that you as the receiver of the information can interpret the uh, value, the validity, those kinds of things. But uh, this also ties into something I'm going to say later in the webinar. So as Julie mentioned, I am a very proud member, board member, uh, founding board member and current active board member in Reed, Washington. Uh, I am also proud to be a member of the author team working with uh, McGraw-Hill Education, uh, specifically on their Wonders uh, uh, K-6 reading program and the Wonder Works accompanying program, which is an intervention program. Uh, I've also written uh, several books, as Amy mentioned, one of which is Reading Fluency. I had the great pleasure of co-authoring that with my friend, uh, Deb Glazer. And I'm specifically mentioning the fluency book today. So I wanted to uh, let you know that that is something that I have published and received some uh, financial benefits from. There are other books and assessments that I have written as Amy mentioned, and I do work as a professional consultant um, and, uh, and at times receive fees for the work that I do. Um, so we're about to spend an hour and a half or so talking about science. So before we launch into that, I want us all to take a deep breath um, and remember why in the world uh, we are spending time on a Saturday morning or for some of you, three o'clock in the morning on Sunday. Um, and for many of you uh, who will watch this later, taking time out of your busy uh, lives to do this work, this is why we do it, because we want this. This is our goal. Somewhere in our hearts, in our minds, uh, we do this work because this is the outcome we want. We want all of our children to be able to read, to enjoy the process. Um, that's why we care. And one way, perhaps, to help this be a universal outcome for our students is to know more and more about the science of reading. So we're going to, I'm going to talk a lot about teaching today. And I wanted to start with an idea that was planted in my head uh, way back in the 1980s. I had the privilege of taking a week 
um, to study at UCLA with Madeline Hunter. Um, and it was just about the time that she wrote the book that I'm quoting from today. But uh, And I know other people have said this, but I heard when I was at UCLA in that amazing week of learning from Dr. Hunter, she frequently talked about the fact that she felt teaching was both a science and an art. Um, from in this book, they talk about, she and her co-author talk about teaching as a science artfully applied. Um, and again, I know other people have said that, but uh, Dr. Hunter really came at education from a scientific viewpoint. She had wanted to be um, a neurosurgeon and found out that in her generation, a female being a neurosurgeon was just not going to happen. So she turned her attention to education, but really approached it scientifically, but always was aware that it's not just here are the scientific rules, here is what science has told us, and you just do these things and kids will learn. It is also an art. So uh, one of the things that she said in this book, she and her co-author, is that education is a relativistic situational profession. It requires a constant stream of decisions. And the, they say there is nothing that an excellent teacher always does except think and or never does except abuse a student. Every other teaching behavior is appropriate in some situations, not appropriate in others. And I've always appreciated that so much. When we think about this incredibly difficult, challenging thing we do, uh, what is the artfulness? Well, part of the artfulness is establishing that absolutely necessary relationship um, with each one of our students. If they don't trust you, if they don't respect you, learning is going to be hard. And science doesn't really tell us a lot about that. So I think of specifically what the art is, is knowing what to do. And that should be based on the best available scientific evidence. So we learn what, but for whom? When do we use it? How much? What's the frequency? What's the dosage? That is what makes teaching so challenging and complicated. And I really do love this, this uh, anecdote from Dr. Donald Langenberg, who himself is a physicist, um, actually specifically a rocket scientist is how he refers to himself. He at one time was the chancellor of the University of Maryland, but he also was uh, the chair of the national reading panel that resulted in that amazing, important report um, over 20 years ago. And it was the US Congress who um, established that uh, panel and asked Dr. Langenberg to chair the panel, but he agreed to do it. But he said right away to his co-panelists, um, he said, I know nothing about reading. I am a rocket scientist. I don't know about reading. Someone gave him a copy of uh, Dr. Louisa Moat's original uh, article. She's since updated, but the very famous article about reading is rocket science. And so after the work of the panel was done, uh, it took two years to review the research and they were ready to release their report. And they first met with the US Congress in a hearing. And Dr. Langenberg said that to the Congress, as a physicist chairing this panel for two years and preparing this report, I have come to realize that teaching reading is really much harder than rocket science. And I think we would all, <laughs> I don't know how hard rocket science is, but there really can't be anything much harder than teaching children. So what is this science of reading that we're here to talk about? Well, whatever it is, there is clearly a hunger from educators and parents to know more about it. Uh, I hope all of you are aware of the Facebook page started by Donna Hedmedic, uh, called The Science of Reading, What I Should Have Learned in College. And as of yesterday, when I finalized these slides, there were over 146,000 members. There's also the Reading League, a very important organization that has, last I looked, uh, over 40,000 members and state chapters in almost all states. And I know that this, this is the map from their website of what states have um, chapters of the Reading League. And I know it's not up to date because uh, both Georgia and um, 
Washington State, for sure, have chapters now that are not represented on, on this map. Um, there's a listserv called Spell Talk. I'll be talking about that later. Um, this is one of the things that all of these have um, links in, uh, in our document uh, so that you can take a look at them. Uh, Spell Talk listserv has over 12,000 members. Um, it is a, a source of information. I will, as I said, talk about that a little bit later. Uh, for a parent organization, there's Decoding Dyslexia, and it goes on and on and on. There's just a deep hunger out there as people become more more aware that there's science to tell us how to do this incredibly important and incredibly challenging thing, which is teaching children to read and write and spell. Um, but we're not starting from scratch. Uh, we know a lot about the science of reading. There is an extensive and rigorous body of evidence about how to teach children to read and the most effective ways to teach them. Some of the things we know most about, there's a lot of agreement that what we've studied the most and know the most about is the early reading development. We know a lot about the essential and foundational role of phoneme awareness, the role of phonics that it, uh, and, and how teaching it explicitly and systematically seems to be uh, the most efficacious, the most um, valuable for students. Uh, we also know part of that uh, extensive and rigorous body of evidence is uh, the role of fluency in vocabulary and comprehension. But when we start to discuss the science of reading or explore it, there are differing definitions and that can keep us um, off balance or confused a bit. So the wonderful organization, the Reading League, took upon itself to try to come up with a definition that we could all get behind. So that is also one of the links that uh, will be um, available to you. So the Reading League pulled together uh, a variety of folks, including uh, researchers and practitioners and professional development providers, um, an amazing panel of people, and wrote a document that I hope that after this presentation, if you haven't already, that you will take a good look at. In their document, they talked about uh, what the science of reading is not. And I think that's very important. It's not just an ideology or philosophy, certainly not a trend, uh, a fad, a new idea, a pendulum swing. Um, we are now in a place with reading science that we can begin to do the stair step growth that has been evident in the medical world for many years. They don't stay in one place, but what the research proves, they don't abandon it and try something completely different. They use the previous information to build in a stair-step direction more and more knowledge rather than fads where, um, oh, let's all wear long skirts. Oh no, let's all wear short skirts. Uh, what we've done in education for a long time has been described as more aligned with the fashion industry than uh, medicine. But we're at the place now where we are making um, and should continue to make stair-step growth. Um, the science of reading is not a political agenda. It's certainly a not a one size fits all. As Madeline Hunter said, we've got the only thing we do all the time um, is think. And uh, what we need to do is make decisions constantly about who needs what, when and how much. Uh, the Science of Reading is not a program. One of the things that you see on the um, that Facebook page of the Science of Reading is, is people who are new on this journey weigh in frequently and ask about a specific program. Is this program SOR? Is this program the Science of Reading? Um, there's not a program uh, that is the science of reading. And it's certainly not one specific component of instruction uh, such as phonics. And that is, you've all probably heard that, um, that uh, criticism of SOR, the science of reading, it's all about phonics. It, it, it certainly is, is not. Um, it is an overview of the scientific process. Well, this is what's provided in that guide. If you read the guide, you will see that they do an overview of some of the scientific processes that are used in compiling the evidence that we are calling the science of reading. And I'm going to review some of that today. Uh, it's a 
an overview of the science of the reading brain, supporting language comprehension, which is absolutely necessary, um, and addressing some of the issues of, of our students who are second language learners. They spend some time um, uh, discussing the MTSS framework, the multi-tiered system of support, because that's one of the ways we effectively get the science of reading implemented in classrooms. And of course, when we talk about reading, we also need to address equity, which uh, they do in the defining guide, the reading league uh, in the defining guide. So as a one statement uh, they make um, overview, what is the science of reading? They say this, the science of reading is a vast interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research about reading and issues related to reading and writing. I think that is a wonderful one sentence summary of this complex thing that they're trying to describe in the defining guide. Um, I was not a member of that panel. If I had been, I would have argued for the addition of a few additional words. Um, I would like us all to remember that yes, science of reading is vast. It is interdisciplinary. But what we're really going to be focused on today is the fact that it is unfinished. It is continuously growing and it is evolving. That's why we're today talking about uh, Science of Reading 2.0. Um, and I do see, Lori, that you've raised your hand. We have decided in part because of the size of our group today that I'm going to wait until the end of my presentation to answer questions. So keep putting your questions in the Q&A um, and uh, I will at the end uh, have a chance to respond to you. So this idea of an unfinished, continuously growing and evolving body of knowledge is really the focus of what I wanna talk about today. And it reminds me of something that I shared at uh, that first uh, presentation from the, uh, uh, from Reed Washington about three years ago, as Julie mentioned, I read uh, aloud a piece uh, from this article that uh, came from The New Yorker. And I remember reading it and it really touched me. Um, I'm a big fan of The New Yorker. I, re I re get an, an issue every week. And this article was written by Jerome Groupman, who is a uh, medical doctor. He was writing about uh, psychiatry in this article, but his his article um, talked about how the medical science evolves. So he started off by saying that as a medical student, that he was taught that peptic ulcers are often caused by stress. And he went on to say that treatments, so I'm reading here from the article, Treatments included bed rest and a soothing diet rich in milk. Anyone who suggested that ulcers were a result of bacterial infection would have been thought crazy. The prevailing view was that no bacterium could thrive in the acidic environment of the stomach. But in 1982, not that long ago, 1982, two Australian researchers who later won the Nobel Prize for their work, proposed that a bacterium was crucial in the onset of many peptic ulcers. Although the hypothesis, because of course it was just a hypothesis at the beginning, that's how all science started. The hypothesis was met with widespread scorn, experimental evidence gradually became conclusive. And that's the same thing that's happening with us in reading today. We don't have a stagnant, vast, complex body of knowledge um, that uh, is, is stagnant. We have one that is continuously growing. So this research described in the defining guide, the complexity of it, comes from thousands of studies in multiple languages. This is not just research about how the uh, reading develops in, in the English language. We've learned a lot about how proficient reading and writing develop, why some have difficulty. We've learned a lot about both how to assess and to teach. So we also know a great deal about how to prevent reading failure and how to intervene as necessary. It's such good, important information. Um, and part of the reason it's so valuable is because it is interdisciplinary. We have information from psychology, 
general and special education, neuroscience, linguistics, um, and it comes in multiple uh, dimensions. And, and uh, uh, we must understand, for those of us who are wanting to embrace this science, really understand how it is developed and how it evolves. So there are two basic types of science that comes from the basic and then the applied sciences. So in the science of reading, we would consider the basic sciences, all those cognitive processes that enable reading as well. And that body of knowledge is really descriptive because we've learned, we have, and we've learned some amazing ways of looking at how uh, the brain does process linguistic information. Um, but we're really describing that. The basic science is saying, this is what happens. There's no particular standards. This should happen or this should happen. It's just a descriptive. These are the processes that happen. Whereas the applied science in uh, science of reading, this would be how do we learn to read? How do we teach? What are the processes or methods that are most effective? And applied science is always normative. There are standards. We want it to be the easiest. We want it to be the best. We want it to be um, the most effective. Um, so that has normative standards. So basic science and uh, applied science work really works together. Uh, and to really wrap our heads around this, we uh, often, I do, often turn to the wonderful explanations from Daniel Willingham, who was explaining basic versus applied science um, in reading, but he used uh, an example from uh, architecture. And he said, and the basic sciences of physics and material science uh, are work hand in glove, if you will, with the applied science of architecture, um, that the basic science helps the architect predict whether a building will stand up, but those sciences don't tell you how to design a building. It can't because designing a successful building has norms or standards um, that's, that have to be applied. How many people do you want the building to hold? What will people do there? What do you care? Um, do you care that what the building looks like? What's your budget? That we might think of as the artistic side of our teaching, uh, where we take the components that we know are important, the phoneme awareness, the, the language, the vocabulary, the fluency, and apply them to a vast range of children in different situations. Another aspect of science has to do with the various theoretical approaches. Um, and uh, Petcher talks about this and colleagues in a uh, article, a series of articles in Reading Research Quarterly, where the whole issue was devoted to this uh, emerging body of knowledge called the science of reading. And in their article, and I have a link to the uh, summary, which the uh, International Literacy Association has made available. So you can go to the ILA website and see the, the summary of all of these articles. Uh, Petcher and uh, and colleagues talk about, remind us that there are different approaches to science that are theoretically driven. Uh, there are those who ad adhere to the correspondence theory, and they want to talk about factual knowledge that's separate from beliefs. This is what is, um, it doesn't matter if I believe it to be true. Um, and this typically the correspondence theory, those advocates are using deductive methods. They have a hypothesis, they test the hypothesis, they operationalize all the component pieces. That's one approach to research, but there are folks in the, um, and folks in the reading world who approach science uh, using a coherence theory, this notion that whatever we would end up calling the truth is uh, determined by alignment of beliefs. It's true if it makes sense to us. Um, and that would in, in um, use the people who are approaching science from this uh, theoretical orientation would use more inductive methods, ethnographic studies or grounded theory or learn, lived experiences. Um, and that is part of that knowledge base is also contributing to what we think of as uh, the science of, of reading. 
there's also these different types, and you may have heard of these, and they all have valuable contributions to understanding both the science as well as the art of teaching. So we can approach research in using qualitative or descriptive methodologies or more quantitative methodologies that are ex fully experimental or quasi-experimental. Um, I know I'm a great fan of the evolving standard of how to conduct a meta-analysis, how we did that uh, even 15, 20 years ago is different than we do it now, but researchers take multiple studies um, and have processes, scientific uh, and statistical processes that they use to glean some evidence, some nuggets of truth that are evidence across several studies. And that's always very valuable um, to enhancing uh, our knowledge about what works best. But of course, um, I think we all agree that the gold standard um, are those uh, randomized control trials in, in the um, quad quantitative methodology um, because that is the gold standard because that design where we randomly assign the subjects, the children in most of our studies um, to different treatments doing that is essential to produce that data that we can then translate into clinical practice. So that's what we really wait for. Um, and RCT is very complex to conduct. It takes a long, long time uh, to administer, to, uh, to conduct that kind of research and then to analyze the data and have that data peer reviewed. It's just a long, long process. And even more, um, we understand the length of the process if we understand the continuum of research from zero to four different stages. Uh, T0 level of research are those basic studies where we define the different mechanisms and the construct. Uh, the constructs and what is malleable? What can we change here? What kind of teaching? Um, uh, should we look at rate of introduction for, for one thing? Um, how, how can we measure rate of introduction? And then we, so the first studies just figure out what we are going to look at. Then once we figured out what we're even going to look at, we define things and we identify the component pieces. Then we have to engage in preclinical studies. We test these new methods, the assessments, the interventions? Can we get agreement between two people who are um, uh, observing um, rate of introduction? Uh, can we, is our methodology for measuring outcomes actually working? So that's a whole level of study. Then uh, is the next level, the clinical research study where we apply these things, but only to specific populations. And this is to test, do they even work out in the real world? Um, one of the T2 level studies, a clinical research study that I cite often because of my interest in dyslexia is uh, this work published by CMOS in 2002 in the journal Neurology. Um, and so think of this as the publication at a T2 level where previously to this, they did work at the preclinical level and the basic level. So years ago, they started with this idea, but this is one of the very first studies that uh, did use the brain scan technology as well as the more traditional way of measuring students by giving them a reading test. And so this study was done with only eight students uh, who ranged from seven to 17 years old. They started by scanning their brains and then giving them a reading test, then um, doing an eight week intensive intervention, uh, basically phoneme awareness, um, but it was a clinical study. It was, it was uh, to test whether this idea even works. It was two hours a day. This is not something that we would do in the real world and found that that intensive intervention worked um, and published that level of study. But to take that then to the next study, they would have to do a clinical implementation in a real world application. And then ultimately, if all of these things work uh, at that we started way back at the basic studies, hoping that they would eventually if we're going to see if they work out in the general population. So uh, this is just a different way of looking at, at research and 
<sighs> understanding why it sometimes takes so long <laughs> to get this information, um, to establish this information, this thing that we thought a theory um, is actually true and it is, it is measurable um, and it is best practice. So uh, we need to turn our attention to the translational science. Yes, as Hempenstahl said, we have this extensive and rigorous body of evidence. Um, and I know many of us are so frustrated with knowing that uh, uh, we have this information but it's not being used in every classroom. Why is this not happening? Why are teachers not using this? So another one of the articles in that special issue of uh, Reading Research Quarterly was done by Amy Solari and colleagues who looked at the science of translating information, any kind of science, um, uh, any kind of information into practice um, and applying translational science that lends to the science of reading. They stated in their article that there, there's a disconnect between this body of knowledge and teacher preparation. And it's not just the United States and Canada, um, it's around the world. Uh, it's blocked, the implementation of this science is blocked in some cases by state and district policies. We know and teachers know what to do and they want to do it, but the policies get in their way. There, we don't in education have as valuable or effective a mechanism for sharing evidence as they do in the medical world. Um, in the medical world, it's not perfect either, uh, but there is there are more um, respected organizations and procedures and journals that everybody relies on. And that's why they've been able to establish this stair step of evidence where we in education is still uh, often mired more in beliefs and feelings. So that is part of why um, Solari and colleagues suggest that we're having difficulty getting this information into classroom. Um, they also are making a, a case that there is a science of translation and that which they describe in this article very wor much worth reading that is being ignored. Um, in by those of us who who very strongly want to see uh, this information being used in classrooms. The other fact, the other reason why the science of reading is not being used in classrooms is just the fact that change is hard. Um, that uh, Facebook group of the science of reading, I should have learned this in college, um, the frustration of so many people, they were taught one way. And now we're expecting them to go in the classroom and do things very, very differently. So it's hard for many reasons, but one is because uh, all of us who are teachers are human beings and we are subject to biases uh, from, this has been uh, identified in, by the um, uh, social psychology uh, uh, who study why we do things as human beings. And we all have confirmation bias and conservatism bias. Confirmation bias is our tendency as human beings to search for, interpret, favor, and more readily recall information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs or hypotheses. And so this bias that we're in, this innately in us as human beings uh, limits our ability to question information um, that, uh, that confirms or upholds. Uh, this uh, uh, limits our ability to question information um, that, that questions, I think, not confirms. Um, we have difficulty questioning information um, that attempts to change our mind about that. I think I may have re <laughs> not written that sentence uh, correctly. Conservatism bias means that, okay, I'm willing to change my mind, um, but uh, I don't go all the way because the new evidence, uh, it's just hard. I wanna hold on to some of, some of my beliefs or part of my beliefs, so I insufficiently change. To help sort through all this, um, as I often do, I turn to the wisdom of Dr. Steve Dykstra. One of the links that I put 
um, available for you is uh, some information about Dr. Dykstra, who is a cognitive, uh, he's a clinical psychologist, and he participates, he's an active supporter of the work of the Reading League. And when they had completed their defining guide about the science of reading, they had a book launch on January 22nd, and they had a series of uh, presenters for that book launch, and um, they recorded that. I, if you haven't seen it, or if you've only seen it once, um, you might want to see it again. So that's part of the links to to look at that. So Steve was one of the presenters that day, and what he said in his session um, was really helpful for me to sort through all of this. This thinking about where are we and where do we need to go in the current understanding of the science of reading. So he, he talked about, as Steve often does, if you know his work, he loves to create analogies. And in his talk on the book launch, he talked about the bull's eye analogy saying this, that the science of reading is not a Google map. It's more like clues to the puzzle pieces of a jigsaw. We have some nice chunks put together we have other pieces, but we don't know where they go yet. Some pieces are missing. And some parts of the puzzle, we know what it looks like. Other parts, we're not even sure what it, we think it, what it might look like, but we're not exactly sure. It's not a roadmap, but puzzle pieces. He went on to say, we do have some things in the bullseye though, some things we absolutely know, and he referred to those as bullseye science, um, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, bullseye science, phoneme awareness, bullseye science, the need to link phoneme awareness and phonics, bullseye science, but how to do that is a little more vague. He goes on to say, Know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Understand what you're doing that may be based in research evidence. You're also going to need your own clinical experience to make uh, decisions. We don't know everything about reading. We will never know everything about reading. And if you go back to Hunter's explanation of there's no lockstep roadmap um, of something we should always do. So we need to... Um, use both that bullseye science, but be ready to step outside because you'll have to know the reason you're stepping outside of the bullseye and know that you could be wrong because we don't have that strong evidence, but we try it because it's our, what we consider to be best practice, but we always continuously have to be ready to change. And he reminds us never lose sight of the bullseye. We don't abandon phonics or phoneme awareness because we don't know everything about how to teach them. So that analogy was very uh, resonated with me. Of course, Steve does a fabulous job. You should definitely take time to hear it in, described in his words, but he's not the only one saying this. Um, Kane and colleagues uh, didn't use the analogy of bull, bullseye science, but they, they did talk about in their 2017 article that there are some areas where we have really a strong foundation. Um, and it mirrors what Dykstra um, and Hempstead and others are saying. Um, we know the most about the theoretical building blocks of early reading acquisition, uh, bullseye science. We know much about the factors that can be um, uh, manipulated uh, to and need to be manipulated differently because of those different individual differences in reading and language. Um, Scarborough's rope really delineates so nicely and very accurately what some of those malleable factors are when she describes the components of language comprehension and word recognition. We know that there are developmental differences. Not all children learn the same, and that's due to both internal factors of the learner and to external factors that we may have um, minimal ability to control. We understand much more now um, from these decades of research about what are the causal mechanisms um, that help improve uh, the outcomes of students who do struggle with learning to read, both the instruction that we can use to prevent those difficulties and the intervention. There is quite a bit of agreement about what are the most 
solidly known um, aspects of reading, including the uh, ways that we measure. So we know a lot, but as Hunter says, and many others say, it's the implementation, it's the art. What do we do? For whom? When? And how much do we do it? What's the frequency? We could talk about that in terms of dosage. So I want to spend the remainder of our time together talking about these components, what moves science to 2.0, the acknowledgement that our science is and always will be unfinished, continuously growing and evolving. And I wanna give you some examples of that. And I want to start with something that we all agree, we all should agree is absolutely bullseye science. Back in 1986, Goff and Tunmer uh, proposed that there was a way of considering uh, reading and in a more simple way, that reading comprehension was the product of language comprehension and decoding. And Goff and Tumner over the decades have received many, many accolades for this uh, theory of the simple view or this framework for looking at view, but lots of criticism too. Um, many people have, have dismissed this by saying, these people are saying that reading is simple. And of course it's not simple, but if you really understood the simple view of reading, you would know that they never proposed as suggested at all that reading is simple. In fact, in this um, study, uh, there's Tunmer, one of the uh, people who proposed the simple view of reading. What they're saying is that reading is so incredibly complex. Um, it has all these components. We have to look at the visual coding and the phonological the coding and the visual, the spell the semantic knowledge, the language contributions, the phonological awareness, all of this so that we can get to reading comprehension. So all they are saying in their theory is that reading is very complex, but we can take a simple view of it by concentrating on the outcome we all want, reading comprehension, and understanding that it is the product of those two components of language comprehension and decoding. Uh, well, actually, that's what they said in 1986, but even bullseye science evolves. The simple view of reading continues to evolve. Teaming up with uh, Wes Hoover in 1990, and then to Hoover partnered up with Tunmer in 2018 um, and discussed in both of these articles and in other places that the simple view of reading model needs to be further detailed and always continue to be tested. And they revised the model and we should be now sharing the equation of the simple view of reading, not as this, but their newest um, uh, conceptualization of the simple view is that reading comprehension is which they define as the ability to extract and construct literal and inferred meaning from uh, discourse in print is the product of language comprehension, the ability to extract and construct meaning from speech and word recognition, which they expanded to say word recognition is the ability to both identify a new unfamiliar word through decoding and ultimately recognize printed words accurately and quickly because that's what gives you the access to uh, the word meanings contained in our mental lexicon. So the newer conceptualization of the simple view aligns even more closely to Scarborough's rope, which is included, of course, in the Reading uh, League's defining guide. Uh, they describe Scarborough's amazing contribution to our understanding as a visual metaphor for the developmental skills over time represented by those strands in reading. Um, and Scarborough herself is very clear um, that she did not model uh, her infographic 
uh, after the simple view, she was simply looking at the same uh, body of evidence and came up with similar conclusions uh, because science is science and bullseye is bullseye, that the end goal, which in the simple view is referred to as reading comprehension, she refers to the end goal as skilled reading, the fluent execution and coordination of the two components, word recognition and language comprehension. She's uh, She also did mention though in a recent um, uh, interview that she did, uh, and I posted a link to that interview. It's fascinating. If you haven't, if you haven't had a chance to hear her, uh, she was interviewed by Donna Hetmanik uh, of the simple of the Facebook group, The Science of Reading. Uh, it's a lovely interview, and she said that the there wasn't anything today um, in 2022 that she would change about the rope, uh, except that originally her original version of the rope did have an arrow underneath it to indicate that it was a developmental model. And when it was published in 2001, um, they took the arrow out, but that's what she would include in her model. So the that simple view of reading uh, theoretical framework continues to evolve. Um, so recently Hoover and Tunmer wrote this wonderful book. I, I am finding it very fascinating. I'm making my way through it, The Cognitive Foundations of Reading. They don't abandon the bullseye science. They say that they, uh, for decades now, that they stand by this idea that reading comprehension is the goal. And the way we get there is through those two components, the interaction, the product of uh, language comprehension reading recognition, but in this book, they deconstruct the model a little further um, into those two components and the component um, contributions of those, which align even more closely uh, to the simple view, uh, to Scarborough's rope, not uh, exactly aligned, but um, it continues to evolve because science is unfinished, continuously growing and evolving. Even when we turn our attention to the bullseye of bullseye science, the National Reading Panel. So as people now 20 some years after the National Reading Panel report do go back and look at uh, what was concluded and reported in that report, uh, researchers such as Chris Schnatzneider and others say that if they were to do it again, they would likely come to the same conclusions. Um, there are new research methodologies. There are new statistical methodologies that may have, uh, that may, if they had been available more than 20 years ago, might have nuance, changed the nuance in a way of some of the uh, conclusions of the National Reading Panel. Uh, but most of the conclusions uh, uh, would have remained the same. I'm really grateful that uh, another contribution that the Reading League did was in 2020, they published uh, a special issue of their journal uh, to update the findings of the National Reading Panel. They asked uh, several people to go back and look at the chapters from the National Reading Panel report and then write an update. So Chris, uh, uh, Schnatzider and his Snyder and his colleagues looked at methodology. Uh, uh, Susan Brady looked at alphabetics and phonics. I did the update on fluency. Kane and colleagues comprehension and vocabulary lumped those two together. And there were some updates on teacher education and computer technology as well. So let uh, I'm going to turn my attention to the fluency chapter. That was what I was asked to review. So I went back and looked at the third chapter of the National Reading Panel report that was written by um, Jay Samuels and uh, Tim Shanahan and Sally Shaywitz. And uh, they wrote many things that would not change, but they did say on page uh, the third chapter, page one, that fluent readers can read text with speed, accuracy, proper expression. On the fifth page of their chapter, they said fluency is the ability to read text quickly, accurately, and with proper expression. When I wrote the update of uh, this uh, chapter in my piece for the Reading League special issue, 
I focused in on that as something that I think we should rethink 20 years later, that current definitions of reading fluency list more commonly accuracy first to emphasize that reading fluently is not reading quickly. It's not reading as fast as possible, that accuracy is really the foundation of fluency. I've had conversations with um, uh, Tim Shanahan about that, and he agrees with me that um, their thinking has evolved and the wording uh, would have changed if they wrote those, those things. I also uh, made some recommendations about a few other updates. So some of the highlights from the update article on comprehension and vocabulary, which they lent together, they said, um, we've learned that we should be teaching these things as a comprehensive integrated process. Um, that comprehension is really best um, understood or constructed, uh, conceptualized uh, differently when we're reading for different purposes, that it's not just this one thing called reading comprehension. We, we th should think about it differently and teach it differently and practice it differently when we're reading for a different purpose. Um, and also reminding us that in the last 20 years that there just is not, there wasn't back in the day of the National Reading Panel and there isn't today strong evidence for teaching the components of uh, reading comprehension separately. So um, we should be thinking of it as this much more integrated um, uh, and comprehensive process. When Susan Brady did an uh, amazing job, in my opinion, reviewing the research in alphabetics, uh, both phoneme awareness and phonics, we were all, uh, those of us who wrote uh, articles in the special issue were given very little uh, space, uh, uh, just a couple of thousand words to write our update, which really limited what we could say. So Susan had a lot more to say about phoneme awareness, and I put a link to um, her expanded version of the article. It's about 40 some pages, and it is available on the uh, Reading League's website. So that's, that's wonderful. She has a synopsis of this in the journal article, but she generously made her entire thinking um, available. And it's really important because uh, we have learned a lot about phoneme awareness. We haven't learned much more that, uh, about its importance because in the last 20 years, we've only confirmed that phoneme awareness is very important and uh, the ability of a young beginning reader uh, to have that strong phoneme awareness does predict later um, ability to read. We do know that it is, of course, very, very difficult for some of our students to acquire that phoneme awareness. Um, we're still looking at, it does not appear that it is necessary to, uh, for the brain to have a phonological sensitivity of the larger units before they can acquire phoneme awareness. And that is something uh, that she describes uh, in really quite a lot of detail in that expanded article. There is some, uh, some belief and some representation in some teacher training materials and in some curricula, um, and certainly in the um, widely used uh, common core standards in the United States kind of implies that first we take a learner through phonological awareness, uh, understanding of syllables and that kind of thing, and then we get to phoneme awareness. Um, Susan is saying that the, the research really um, is not very conclusive that we need to do that. She does say very strongly that it is absolutely important, absolutely necessary to connect the sounds, the phonemes with the orthographic representation of letters as soon as possible. Um, but that is partly what makes the teaching of this so challenging and difficult and where we need to bring in our artistry and our clinical experience because what does as soon as possible mean? Does it mean the first day of kindergarten? Does it mean somewhere in preschool? Does it mean after so many weeks of instruction? Um, 
uh, what it's going to vary tremendously from child to child, but uh, the agreement is we need to do that as soon as possible. When uh, Dr. Brady turned her attention to phonics, she said it's clear from the current evidence that synthetic um, instruction of phonics is more effective than analytic. Uh, it's clear from these past 20 years of research that phonics instruction needs to continue beyond just that K1 initial threshold, but is very clear based on, uh, she cites the research of Carol Connor, um, that the dosage needs to be matched to need, that it's phonics, un phonics just like phoneme awareness is not a one size fits all. Uh, different children are going to need uh, the, uh, the instruction of phonics differently. Um, more recent research in terms of word families or onsets rhymes indicates that it can be helpful, but uh, that it should be part of the instruction that happens after uh, the students have more firmly learn that one-to-one -one, uh, process of connecting a phoneme to a grapheme um, and then expanding it after that. And she's uh, citing research that says phonics should be part of engaging reading and writing um, and likely spelling activities too, that it all should be interwoven together, that when we approach phonics as something different from word reading or phonics, uh, different from something than writing or reading as something different than writing. Uh, it's not as strong as when we um, connect all those things together. Another example of the unfinished, continuously growing and evolving nature of science, um, we can turn to Tim Shanahan. Um, and in many different sources, I'm going to cite a couple of different places, but I'm sure many of you, I hope that you are familiar with his blog that on pretty much a weekly basis, he's a very pro <laughs> prolific blogger, um, he shares with us um, his his responses to questions. And we all recognize Tim Shanahan, um, as described on his website, as one of the world's premier literacy educators. He knows so much. He's done so much research. He has made major contributions to our understanding about what reading is, what the science of reading is. Um, to me, that's indisputable. I've had the privilege, um, the luck, <laughs> to uh, work really closely with Tim over the last 20 years. He's also a member of the McGraw-Hill education team. Um, and in that work and in other work, we've had a chance to work together. I'm a great admirer of, of what he says, but he also admits that um, his thinking evolves, that the nature of learning e continues to uh, evolve and is unfinished. So very recently in his March um, blog, uh, which was focused as almost all of his blogs are there. He's focused on answering a teacher's question. So some teacher wrote to him uh, saying she was a middle school teacher and she was wondering if she should be focusing in on fluency instruction or decoding with her middle school students. And Tim's answer um, was this. Years ago, I would have said, avoid phonics instruction for older students. Stu uh, studies had concluded that phonics at those grade levels didn't pay off. Then I was on the national reading panel and we found studies that showed phonics instruction could improve the decoding abilities of older students. So he has changed his mind. Um, and later in the blog, he wrote again, more recent studies have reshaped my thinking again. So he's continuously reading the research, evaluating the quality of the research, making a determination of it fact should he change his mind and when he's convinced he does. And he says, um, uh, not to say I was wrong, I was sharing what was knowledge, the knowledge at the time and best practice at the time, um, but my uh, thinking has been reshaped again because of recent studies. Um, he also contributed to, uh, as frequently does, to uh, the uh, journal, the Reading Research Quar Quarterly. He wrote an article recently, in fact, in 2021, about dyslexia, in which he said this, 
the most precise expression of the best data currently available should be considered provisional at best and open to revision as new data becomes available. So this is almost um, just a statement of his own personal beliefs about the science of reading. So it's not just Goff and Tunmer it's, or Hoover, it's not just Shanahan, uh, even Jan Hasbrook and Deb Glazer need to commit to the idea that science is unfinished, continuously growing and evolving. So I mentioned at the onset that Deb and I worked together to write a book uh, on reading fluency. We actually, this current edition is our second version of that book. We wrote and self-published an earlier version. Then we worked with um, PD Essentials from Benchmark Education to publish this book. And it was published in 2019. Um, and just recently, um, the PD Essentials folks said that it was time to um, not do a whole new second edition of the book, but that uh, it was time to do a reprint. And uh, they gave us the opportunity to go through the book and make uh, changes that we wanted to change, which was just a wonderful opportunity. So Deb and I, uh, just a few weeks ago, actually went page by page, uh, looking at everything we wrote, including the captions on the pictures and everything, um, and found some things we did want to change. Back in 2019, we wrote this, that reading fluency is a complex skill to assess and diagnose. Now, we have shifted our thinking about reading fluency and um, our thinking about how we wanna talk about it. We both agree that reading fluency is not a skill, uh, whereas we can think about phoneme awareness as being a skill. We can think of phonics as being a skill. We can think of comprehension as being the interweaving of lots of different skills. But fluency, like comprehension, is more the outcome or the interweaving of many different skills. So what the revision, um, the new uh, revision will say this in place of that previous sentence, we have learned that the essential component of skillful reading, that essential component that we call fluency is complex and multifaceted. Because of this, adequately assessing reading fluency is also complex and multifaceted. Throughout the book, wherever we had previously called fluency a skill, we now rewrote that to talk about it as a complex outcome of the um, of the mastery of or acquisition of many different skills. A different place in the book, we were talking about measuring reading fluency. And in 2019, we wrote this. While there is ample empirical evidence that it is important for students to maintain word correct per minute rates minimally at the 50th percentile, there is no research to suggest that pushing students to have uh, word correct per minute scores above the 50th percentile results in any long-term benefit. Well, <laughs> we have revised that statement. In 2022, the new revision will say this, there is strong empirical evidence that it is necessary for students to minimally read at the 50th percentile to support comprehension. So we didn't change that part. And that reading at the 75th percentile is sufficient for optimizing comprehension. And that is based on research that was not available to us in 20, uh, 2019 when we published the first book. This new research by White and colleagues uh, was uh, summarized in a report. They went back and looked at the comprehension level of students in the fourth grade who had taken the NAEP score, the NAEP assessment, and then went back and administered some oral reading fluency assessments, measuring those students word correct per minute, and then mapped out the different levels of proficiency and comprehension with their different uh, words correct per minute scores, just really clear and compelling information about the value of reading above the 50th percentile for some students, but no evidence. It really clearly tops out. And when I'm talking about percentile, those are the percentiles of the Hasbrook and Tyndall norms. So 
Um, a link to that White et al. study, that summary report is also one of the links in um, our, that we're sharing with you today. Uh, not only my thinking about fluency has continued to change, but other aspects of reading. For many, many years, I've been compiling a document that I call my conclusions from reading research. I just felt I needed a way to, uh, for myself, to continue to document my growing, evolving, uh, changing understandings about what we can really glean from reading uh, research. And I do keep this document continuously updated as new research comes my way. Um, but what I've been saying for many, many years in this document is that compelling evidence from a convergence of reading research clearly indicates that approximately 90 to 95 percent of students can achieve literacy skills at or approaching grade level and that these statistics include students with dyslexia and other learning disabilities. I started uh, this compilation and my conclusions from research. I started this back in 1998. And I remember it was after I read this study by Foreman and colleagues that talking about their research in the early um, interventions with students that prevented reading failure. And they were then talking about 90%, uh, possibly a little higher than 90% of children could be taught to read successfully early on. So that first study is what I documented, but I wasn't done. I kept looking every time I would see a new study that talked about the percentage of children who could be taught to read successfully, I documented it. And over the years, new studies of course, came in. Uh, 2007 was a very prolific year. I am not uh, at all suggesting that I have found every single study, but when I do read them and compile them, and what I started to notice as the years went by, that some of these researchers were saying that it probably is more than 90%. It probably is closer to 95%. But um, I continue to say in my document that 90 to 95% was probably what we should be saying until I read this article where uh, Sharon Vaughn and Jack Fletcher's two of my research heroes said that we think there is now ample evidence to suggest that educational systems can be organized so that the vast majority of students, close to 95%, will be success, reasonably successful readers when these systems are effectively implemented. So I now, in that document, after reading that article, I have changed um, uh, and my recommendation, my statement, this is not recommendations, it's simply my beliefs um, that approximately 95% of our students can achieve literacy skills at what we would call grade level or very close to grade level. So I took that article, added it to my list and acknowledging that um, my understanding is unfinished continuously growing and evolving. There is a link to my most current version of that document um, in, in our links that uh, have been posted to our website. Um, and I again see several of you have your hands raised and if it's a question that maybe Julie or Amy can answer for you, but um, I'm coming toward the end now and I will stop and we'll have an opportunity to answer your questions. Um, but that's not it. There are many others uh, who work very diligently in the field of uh, reading science who continue to grow and evolve, including Nancy Young, my friend and colleague from Canada, who several years ago created this amazing infographic right up there in terms of amazing infographics in my mind with uh, Scarborough's Rope. So she created this ladder of reading, which demonstrated uh, the, the, the conclusion that I've come to that almost all students can acquire adequate reading and writing. But her ladder documented the fact um, that some children are going to climb this ladder more easily than others. But Nancy is also one that continues to 
um, read research and knew that uh, the, her understandings of science were unfinished and needed to continuously evolve. So she wanted to represent the more current research findings um, in a updated version of her ladder, now called the ladder of reading and writing. And uh, you can see some of the changes that she made. Well, the obvious one is she added writing, knowing that the research can, is continuing to be very compelling that this this reading and writing are really two sides of the same coin. Spelling is in there or encoding is in there uh, as well. So that was one of the changes, the title. She even uh, had the artist that she works with change the graphic. She had originally one child holding a book and she wanted to represent the joy is accessible to every single child attempting to climb this ladder. She also added pencils because of adding writing. So this uh, child has a pencil in his back pocket and there's a pencil up here at the, at the very top of the ladder as well. Uh, another change was the gradations of colors between these different levels of, of uh, groups of children um, that of course there's no, they don't fit neatly and tidily into boxes. There's, there's um, especially at the edges, uh, overlap between the students we would call students who uh, fit the categories of the red um, bar or group um, along all that way. She also changed the wording within each of those gradations. She adjusted the wording based on the more current science of reading for describing the journey of these students and importantly added some information on the side um, about uh, external factors, the data that is necessary, and some of the factors that influence whether these students are going to uh, easily climb this ladder or have a more difficult time. Uh, Nancy has uh, explained a lot of her thinking in the evolution a synopsis of the update in a blog that she wrote and a YouTube video that she made explaining the changes. And links to both of those are available. Um, uh, in at our website. And also, um, we did a reveal, the Reed, uh, Reed Washington did a reveal. Um, we hosted Nancy's reveal of her new infographic. Um, and at that time, we talked about our plan, our hope, Nancy and I, that we would work together to uh, write a book about this new infographic, uh, The Ladder of Reading and Writing. And um, we now do have a contract. We are beginning that process. We have some meetings next week. So um, sometime soon, we hope by the end of 2020, Twenty, uh, we will have uh, that book available to share with you. So what else keeps uh, evolving and growing? Surely not explicit instruction. Uh, we understand explicit instruction to be evidence of that bullseye science that Steve Dykstra talked about. We've been studying explicit instruction for a very long time. What we today call explicit instruction evolved uh, out of research that was being done in the 60s and the 70s. Um, explicit instruction is sometimes referred to also as direct instruction. Um, when the term direct instruction is used, um, sometimes called big D, big I, uh, or big DI, uh, refers to a set of uh, materials, commercially available materials that use the principles of direct instruction. But um, we understand and trust and revere uh, explicit instruction because of the vast amount of research that's been done to validate it. It's been done both in general and special education research. And what we know about explicit instruction is that it is effective and efficient for teaching new skills. And for those of you who know a little bit, you've heard about explicit instruction. You may have, you may understand it to be that three-step process of I do, we do, you do. Uh, but it is much more than that. Um, Anita Archer and Charles Hughes wrote what I consider the Bible of explicit instruction, a link to this book. You can purchase it on uh, Amazon and other sources. Uh, 
16 chapters in this book about what the elements of explicit instruction are, certainly include the I do, we do, you do, but it's a, a lot more than that. But even though we may consider uh, explicit instruction to be bullseye science, there are still people who at some point may say, well, wait a minute, we need to rethink about this. We need to talk about this. One of the people who took this on recently was Mark Seidenberg in a talk that he made um, recently, March of this year, um, uh, at the uh, Atlanta Speech School Symposium in a webinar uh, uh, where he addressed many things that he's concerned about, about uh, that we would call the science of reading. And he, he made a lot of statements that uh, annoyed, <laughs> bothered, uh, angered several people for a variety of reasons. He made some big, bold statements about many aspects of uh, what a lot of us would consider um, settled bullseye science. And one of the things he took on in his talk was uh, explicit instruction. And he, he said that he had some concerns. He thought that, um, that many people in the science of reading community were overemphasizing the importance of, of explicit instruction. And he framed his concerns um, about the, uh, these. He, he said that the, the goal of instruction should be to create conditions where learning is happening without explicit instruction, that we shouldn't hold up explicit instruction as the best way or the only way. Um, we have to be careful about that. He said that our goal should always be to get students to be skilled readers. And once they're skilled readers, reading is automatic and precognitive um, and made the point that most of what all of us learn happens implicitly. And he reminded us about the uh, what we know about statistical learning or self-teaching, which is, um, you might think, antithetical to explicit instruction. Um, and I have to say, this is my own uh, reveal here. When I heard Mark's talk, uh, I heard him say some things that did poke at my belief system a little bit. And because of that, because of, of, uh, of my own personal biases and my um, uh, bias, my belief systems uh, annoyed me a bit. And when he first was sort of uh, suggesting that we need to rethink explicit instruction, I, I was a bit concerned. But when I really uh, paid more attention and listened to it a second time, I thought his points were, were really well taken um, in terms of we do need to be careful. We do need to know when to teach it. I went back and looked at uh, what Archer and Hughes had written about explicit instruction. Um, and they said the science says that explicit instruction is in fact helpful for all learners, all students who are learning new skills and content. When you're learning anything new, you want someone to show you what it looks like. You want them to guide you through practicing learning, and then you're ready to do it independently. So all of us who are learning new skills and content benefit from explicit instruction. And they pointed out that the research is quite clear that it is absolutely essential for our learners who are struggling or disadvantaged. Uh, a newer study, um, Rebecca Treman and her colleague wrote about spelling, which is um, her particular area of specialty, and a recent study where they used direct instruction and said that statistical learning is always valuable, it's the goal, but it's often slow and incomplete. And that they, in their study, they talk about how direct instruction improved the performance of the students. So it gets back to what Hunter told us, what do we do? We need to know what to do. So where do we use uh, explicit instruction? When do we use it? Who is the students, who are the students who would value, benefit from that? How often do we do it? How much do we do it? Um, these are the things that I think Mark Seidenberg was suggesting we need to rethink. We need to be sure that when we are choosing to do direct instruction, we're informed about 
for whom, when, um, and the frequency. So where do we go from here? I think that we should follow the guidelines of Nathan Clemens and colleagues who recently proposed a code of ethics. And this is also references, their proposed code of ethics is referenced in the Reading League's um, document, defining a document of the science of reading. They say that, uh, of course, things are going to continue to change and we will have disagreements about them. We need to disagree respectfully. We need to recognize the fallibility of anecdotes and personal experiences. Just because you hear a teacher saying, oh, it worked for me, it worked in my classroom, I tried it and it worked. Uh, we need to remember that the plural of anecdote is not data, just because uh, it's worked for many people. That's not sufficient for us to say. It can say, I want to explore that further. I want to think about that. That's a new idea for me, but it's not at all the same as evidence. When we do find some evidence, we want to fairly evaluate it. We want to be sure that we are identifying best practices from multiple studies. One of the reasons that I so uh, revere and admire and take time to really look carefully when a new um, uh, meta-analysis comes out. And the uh, if you read that special issue of the Reading League Journal where they updated the National Reading Panel report that Chris uh, Schnatzneider's uh, article and colleagues about the newest methodologies that researchers have to apply to meta-analysis. We're just getting better and better and better at, at doing that. We also need to understand that as much as we know, we need to be prepared to dig deeper and seek clarification. So I want to share with you how I dig deeper and seek clarification. I think they're absolutely right that we need to do this. Um, and all of us have different abilities to do that. It takes time for one thing to dig deeper and seek clarifications. Um, I am no longer teaching in a classroom every single day and with responsibilities of raising a young family and all those things that eat up so much of, our, of your time. But I do, so I have more time than some people and I try to use some of that time to do my own digging deeper and seeking clarification and then share it with um, people uh, like many of you attending this webinar who want to dig deeper and seek clarification. So I want to be very transparent about how I do that work. So for me, uh, I use these tools and resources. I am a member of the Spell Talk listserv that has about 12,000 people. It is it was started originally by um, Jan Wasowitz, who is a, she's got to be one of the world's most <laughs> Uh, experts in speech and language pathology. So it has an orientation around that, but Jan does a superb job of uh, moderating the questions and comments that come in and allows for a real wide range of really deep, professional, respectful conversations around research. Um, so that's one. And all of the links to all of these things are in, in that document that has been posted to our website. I recently um, uh, signed up for the newsletter of John Lloyd, um, a fellow University of Oregon alum who writes about special education. And he goes through current um, and sometimes uh, historic research from special education and makes it available to us. And I have found that very valuable. I try always to keep up on, on Tim Shanahan's blog, Pamela Snow's, and there are many, many others. Um, I've uh, tried to keep up on the best podcasts. I'm really a fan of the Amplify Science of Reading podcast, the Reading Leagues podcast, Teaching, Reading, and Learning. There are many, many others. When I'm out in social media that often isn't as carefully um, uh, vetted or moderated as uh, spell talk is, I look for these names. Uh, th this is not all of them, but uh, Holly Lane, Mark Shin, Matt Burns, Stephanie Stoller, and many, many others 
are very informed uh, people about the science of reading. Uh, I would consider them all experts in their own field. And they generously spend time on social media um, responding to some of the questions or concerns that come up. So if I see that Holly has posted a response, I will stop and read it. Uh, Mark Shin does the same kind of thing in uh, school psychology. Um, Matt Burns is very active in, uh, uh, on Facebook and in Twitter, Stephanie as well. So if they're responding, I stop and read their comments because um, they are very aligned to truly understanding and growing with the science as we learn it. Conferences are a wonderful way if you have the opportunity to attend conferences. My personal choices, um, I've attended every year uh, since the inception of the Plain Talk conference um, annually held in New Orleans, unless we have to move online, but they did a pivot there and we had a, a year online. The Reading League has a wonderful conference, the International Dyslexia Association. I hope most of you are aware of uh, the Institute of Educational Sciences, which is a federally funded group, which funds research, but then also funds uh, teams of people very much like the National Reading Panel, but an ongoing uh, changing group of uh, folks who are designated to review research and then write reports that are then made available for free uh, to anyone. These are This is US research, but the research is available to anyone. This is US tax dollars at, at work. So I would definitely take advantage of those IES reports. Um, similarly, uh, federally funded, the National Center on Intensive Intervention does the same kind of thing, reviews research, publishes report, a recent report, and again, I put a link to this in that document, was done by Kim St. Martin and colleagues on um, what we know, what's good solid research about intensifying literacy instruction. Um, and webinars for, for <laughs> uh, the last two years, uh, many of us have discovered webinars. We at Reed Washington and many, many others at Reed Washington, we've had webinars by Dave Kilpatrick, Deb Glazer, Caroline Denton, um, uh, uh, Anita Archer, we had uh, the reveal of Nancy's new infographic uh, and, and more to come. Um, and I'm also going to recommend Twitter. And, and uh, this is kind of surprising to me to recommend this as a way uh, when we're talking about a, a code of ethics for the science of reading. Um, and I will tell you several years ago, I would not have suggested it because I really understood Twitter to be this un... <laughs> um, um, uh, monitored kind of wild, uh, the old west kind of anybody can go there and say anything. But what I have discovered is uh, that if you connect um, and follow certain people, that it keeps you away from all that other stuff. So uh, I continue to be a big believer in connecting with the right people. In fact, today, before this webinar started, um, I found a link that I might not have found otherwise uh, to a brand new uh, podcast dropped yesterday by Emily Hanford um, on some new findings related to reading recovery. And uh, on Twitter also, Mark, Matt Burns uh, shared uh, an open access article on uh, some updated research on reading fluency. Um, I just found that this morning, so I didn't have a chance to, to read that. Um, but I will, and I have found Twitter to be an enormous source of uh, good connection to science um, uh, for me. So that's one of the ways I dig deeper and seek clarifications. Clemens et al. also reminded us to have courage to reconsider our thinking, critique ourselves, remembering that we all have conservation and conservatism bias because we're human beings, but self Critiquing doesn't mean beating ourselves up. Um, I hope you agree with Maya Angelou that we need to acknowledge that if we keep learning, um, that when we know better, we do better. We have to be gentle with ourselves. This is hard, hard work. We should, when we're sharing information, examine and disclose conflicts of interest, which is what I did at the beginning of this session, and base our decisions on the quality of evidence following that correspondence theory, not just 
popularity, that coherence theory. So some wise words um, from our colleagues to finish up. Tim Shanahan, the most precise expression of the best data currently available should be considered as provisional at best and open to revision as new data becomes available. So wise. Emily Solari, communicating aspects of the science of reading where a compelling evidence base does exist, but not overstating what we know is essential. We don't know everything about reading. We don't know and we never will. And I'm going to give Steve Dykstra the final word here that the science of reading is something we have to wrestle with, struggle with, something we're going to sometimes disagree about, but don't abandon this journey of science by getting frustrated listening to those who disagree about those unfinished, continuously growing and evolving outer rings. So my goals were to affirm, remind or extend your knowledge. Um, and if you have extended your knowledge, <laughs> Uh, let's just understand when we know better, we can do better because we have such an important goal to achieve. Um, I do thank you all so much for being here. Those of you who are with us today live and um, thank you to all who will listen to this later. Um, and now I'm going to stop and leave some time for answering some of those questions that I know have come in. So, hey, Julie. So Jan, I just want to say this because I think uh, an, uh, Karen kind of sums it up for us. She says, thank you for being so transparent of your learning and professional growth process. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. You're welcome. Yes. Mm -hmm. With that, we have a lot of great questions. We right, do, Amy? Yep. We do, but we have one that was asked many times and it's a quick answer. So I'm just going to, if that's okay, I'll just start with that one. Please Jan, do. Lots of folks want to know when your revised edition of the fluency book is coming out. Do you have a date mm. for that? I don't know, actually. I would have to ask the publisher, but they have what they have told me is that all the they accepted all of the revisions we suggested and that they have been made. But um, I would assume uh, that, you know, I would assume it very soon. That's all I can say. Thank Perfect. you for your interest for those who asked that question. Thanks. Should we start with Melanie's question, Amy? Yes, and we should preface it by saying we have an incredible number of very thoughtful, beautifully written questions and not likely enough time to get through all of them. So we will do our very best. So thank you for all of your thoughtful questions. My school board does not know about the science of reading, or if they do, they are not sharing their knowledge. How do we get others on board? Thoughts? Yeah. Well, you might go and find that article about translational science, what science actually says about making, making changes, because um, there is some science and guidelines about that. But um, I would say, I mean, we know it's hard, and we've watched, um, we've watched folks make uh, big changes and then leadership changes and those changes go away. Um, I find that the most sustainable changes happens at the grassroots level. The, the work that teachers do to, to make the changes in their own classroom and share openly and bravely with their colleagues and watch one colleague at a time be persuaded and curious and what are you doing that's working so well and uh, learning from colleague to colleague. I think, um, and I know uh, that's one way, that's the way that I think most of us have some access to this change. There is in the background at a national level and probably internationally, this is happening for changing the laws and changing the way teacher education is being provided. Um, it's, it's changing from the top and the bottom, but your question about what can we do, I think is walk the walk, um, talk the talk, be brave and, uh, and uh, share out loud your own journey um, and bring in a colleague who's, who might be curious um, and interested in exploring this. And of course, Amy or Julie, if you want to weigh in on any of these things, I, I hope that you will. I think um, you did a great job there. Yeah. Uh, 
I'm looking for the question that I just ah yeah. whole class teaching course. That's the one I was looking for. Uh, is it anon? Oh. It's from an anonymous person. Yes, it is. We've got so many great questions. Can I read it since I found yes, it? Yes, got it. Please. I am observing a big push toward whole class early reading instruction in the name of science of reading versus differentiated instruction or flexible, purposeful grouping. Is that supported by the research, Jan? Say the first part again. I was it, clicking something yeah. in here. I am observing a big push toward whole class early oh, reading instruction yeah. in the name of science of reading. Yeah. Uh, I think that is one of those areas where we are going to see some pendulum swing from whole class to small group to whole class to small group. Um, it's very complex to study and uh, there is conflicting research. Um, there is certainly some people who I greatly admire pointing out the obvious that it is very efficient to teach whole class. If small group is simply the same information being taught three different times to different groups of children, that's something that perhaps might be more efficiently presented as whole class. But those of us who work with children uh, more down at the bottom of the ladder or the top of the ladder who um, really learn differently at a different rate and a different pace and need um, uh, perhaps different kinds of instruction or certainly different dosages or intensity, we're only going to meet their needs in small group instruction. So I think that the uh, this goes right back to Madeline Hunter's idea of this challenge of the art and science. We need whole class instruction. Absolutely, it would be ridiculous to give that up. We must have small class to small groups to address uh, the individualized needs of children. And there's compelling evidence on both sides. So there's where the artistry. How much? Um, how often? Uh, maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, we'll have some better guidance that might be more of the puzzle put together about this is what you should do always. Um, but I kind of doubt it. I think the determination of when to do whole class and small group, but um, I cannot believe, um, I cannot imagine or conceive that we are going to meet the needs of all the children on that ladder um, to meet all the components of the simple view and Scarborough's rope by doing whole class instruction. Excellent. Uh, do, we, do you have another one queued up or? Uh, no, go for it. Okay. Uh, so this is a question uh, in which I totally relate to. I'm wondering, this is from Stacy. I'm wondering if there is a group or an effort underway that's working on developing a professional mechanism for sharing science of reading evidence, much like the medical field. Um, well, I think there's a lot of people who think they are. Um, I think some uh, many of the professional organizations, uh, that's why they exist. You look at their mission statement, they would say that's why they do it. Uh, but there's there are a lot of biases. These are organizations all run by human beings. And they so they sort through things and they share things that they, they believe in. Um, I would say one of the groups doing the best of that is uh, the Reading League. Um, they have been accused um, of having biases and, and presenting information through a filter. Um, Again, they're all human beings. So yes, that's that's what they they are going to do to a certain extent. But we, um, as uh, as users of that information, are going to approach that understanding that we have to reflect on the quality of information, that kind of thing. I I think that um, I know at Reed Washington we are trying to be open and eclectic and sharing information from varieties of sources, but. Um, uh, I, I think that if you want to start somewhere, I, I would look at what the Reading League is attempting to do um, uh, and keeping in mind that we have to use our own, our own filters and our own belief systems and never is going to be a single source. Even in the medical world, there's not a single source of information that everybody just lockstep follows. Speaking of the Reading League, one of the questions was, do you recommend certain decodable text? And if you go to the Reading League site, I believe they have a list of decodable texts. So you could look and choose yeah. from that. So there and are the, a lot of resources there. There are. There yeah. are. 
And the best will always be a list. No, but nobody will ever say these are the best. This is the curriculum. These are the best decodable texts. So that's one of the things the Reading League is trying to do is give some framework for you as practitioners to make your own uh, evaluative decisions about these very complex decisions. Like that, the architecture idea that uh, uh, Daniel Willingham talked about is, you know, what's your budget? Uh, what what do you need? Who are your children? All of these things will affect your decision about that. I have another question that's really practical. It is about the workshop model. Now, if you've been teaching for a while, everybody knows about the workshop model. So Natasha asks, could you speak to the ideas of workshop and science of reading? It seems that workshop is a way to structure time that could definitely incorporate what we know about how, the how of teaching, the science of reading. So it seems like they aren't really contradictory, but would love to hear what you think about that. Well, the, the, the term workshop model has been um, appropriated, perhaps we could say, or branded in many ways by the work of Lucy Calkins and her colleagues who have been, in my mind, justifiably critiqued for um, uh, pro providing a guidance for teaching that is not has not been fully aligned with the science of reading. So there's that danger of what do we mean by workshop? Are we talking about Lucy Cock and T uh, uh, Teachers College notion of workshop um, or a different notion of more of a generic allowing students to work together and co collaborate? Um, so it's a little bit tricky in a short answer to say. The notion of, um, I find much of what Lucy Calkins has been, has been sharing and promoting um, and, the, uh, and Teachers College to be problematic. And she has acknowledged that in saying she needs to catch up with the science of reading. But if we can provide that foundational work of the foundation instruction that our children are going to need in different dosages and amounts um, and incorporating some opportunity for them to work together, if that's what the workshop model means, that they have the opportunity to collaborate and explore and extend um, uh, their work that they've learned from me. I have taught them explicitly, systematically these components. I think that's wonderful. In fact, um, I often talk about the three-step process of explicit instruction, the I do, we do, you do, as being better conceptualized as a four-step model based on uh, some, in my mind, compelling research. Certainly we need the I do, the teacher shows you what to do. We do the amount of guided practice you need, but then go to the y'all do step, which is no teacher, the students are working together. And if we're thinking of that as the workshop model, I'm a strong believer in that. I've seen that implemented at the preschool level, uh, middle school level, uh, it can be very, very valuable. And then of course, always, to uh, remind herself about Mark Seidenberg's point, we need the opportunity to work on our own and learn on our own and build those statistical learning mechanisms in our brain. So we need all of it. So I'm a believer um, in that conceptualization of the workshop model. And Julie or Amy being um, in the field practitioners now, if you wanna weigh in on that at, at any point, that would be nice too to hear. So the workshop model has like a mini lesson component. So I could see doing a mini lesson component at the carpet with kids if you wanted to do that kind of a thing and then move in, that might be your I do. And then, sorry, my dog's now barking. And then, then there's, you know, the we do, we try something together and then kids try it on their own. Um, if, if that is something that maybe your principal comes in and wants to see, we've had that happen before where they want to see kids getting a mini lesson, whatever that means, if that sort of fulfills it, I think you, you can, but I do like the, I do, we do, you do, y'all do. That's my, that's, that's what I'm about. And I would just say from a reading interventionist perspective, 
my groups are, you know, in for 30 minutes and out. And so we don't ever really get to that y'all do portion um, right. just because again, it's about that dosage and right. what is the targeted goal of that. You want to use time. those 30 minutes for the most productive and right. the research on the value of explicit instruction, especially as uh, Anita uh, Archer says, for those students who are struggling, that's a mm -hmm. much wiser use of time. But those kids then come back into their classroom. Yeah. And right. can participate into y'all do. That's right. That's, that's the point. Yeah. And it's so great if, if Julie and I teach in the same school <clears throat> to be able to have a partnership with the classroom teacher and the tier two teacher and the tier three teacher so that the kids are getting a little bit of all of that mm -hmm. so that they're getting what they need. Um, I have another question here that is kind of a two-parter. It starts with, is reading comprehension the ultimate goal? What about critical reading? Well, I have to say that I am uh, uh, not an expert in comprehension. There are people who are. Um, uh, I attended a webinar recently where Matt Burns, who I cited previously, was asked a question about reading comprehension and it made me laugh because he said, oh, whenever anybody brings up reading comprehension, I wanna change the subject. And I, <laughs> I feel kind of the same way. Reading comprehension is so incredibly complex in my fairly basic understanding about the complexity of what those, the research understanding is that critical thinking would be part of reading comprehension. And we do need to teach that to children, how they read, how they approach text. Um, uh, Kate Kane and uh, her colleagues who wrote the updated um, chapter or article in the the Reading League's update um, special issue of the National Reading Panel report talked about reading comprehension as being something that is very intricate and uh, best taught interwoven and best taught to the purpose of the reading and the genre and everything. We 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 should approach reading comprehension very differently if teacher if we're working to read and understand a piece of poetry or a piece of historical text or a piece of uh, science fiction literature. Comprehension means, uh, I mean, the basic of comprehension is you can pull the words off the page and make sense of them accurately. Um, but what we do with that thinking, uh, whether we critique it um, or we simply understand it, um, that's for a whole nother webinar and we should do one on that topic for sure. Well, I think the second part of the question is even a, is a second whole other webinar. Um, and I'll just read it because I think it's an important question that even if we don't have time to fully answer it, it's a good one to ponder. The populations sampled in many of the science of reading studies do not reflect the populations in schools. And the vast majority of the research has been conducted by white researchers. How can we square teaching based on these findings, which is obviously important, with the need to center black and brown students in our work and to engage in culturally sustaining pedagogies, which are rooted in asset framing, not deficit framing. The field tends to cop out on this question. It's a really complex question about working from two arguably incompensurable, wow, I'm dyslexic, so I feel good about that. I think I read that right, paradigms simultaneously. I'm so interested in your thoughts about this. That's a big meaty question. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you would like to hear my thoughts on this because this is an incredibly complex topic. Right now I am working uh, with uh, a colleague that's been a very wonderful process. Dr. Kimyana Burke and I are co-editing a special uh, edition of uh, a journal, the, uh, the Journal of School Psychology, where the entire journal will be devoted to looking at the intersection of the science of reading and equity and social justice. So for the last many months, we've been reaching out to researchers to ask them to attempt to address this topic um, and folks who are also going to write opinion pieces about this. So this is something I've been steeped in for the last few months and we're just at the point of pulling this all together. So I absolutely agree with the person that asked that question. This is very important. We do need, I think that Clemens um, and colleagues who proposed that uh, 
code of ethics for the science of reading, that's embedded in there that we need to uh, be cognizant of the biases and prejudices and limited world vision of some of these people who are writing articles or proposing how we should interpret these articles. Um, we have much more to be thinking about than just the mechanisms of how the brain learns to read. This is absolutely fundamentally an issue of social justice and societal equity, and we have got to figure out how to get this right. And we need to have these uh, brave and courageous and complex conversations to get there. Thank you, Jan. What a great answer. <laughs> well, it's something I've been thinking about for, yeah. for quite a while now. I think that it's probably time to wrap it up. All right. I Let's have see. just, can I just ask one quick thing? So many questions on reading fluency, too many to answer here today. And they know you're such an expert on that and that you are the author of the research or one of the two authors on the benchmarks. Um, I believe in the links is um, a link to your reading fluency book. Would that the be book. helpful? Yeah. yeah. And then any other place that you might send people? Um, uh, yes, I didn't put a link uh, in there for the most recent re uh, research study that Jerry Tyndall and I did, uh, but it is all over the internet. In fact, an easy place to find it, uh, the most recent study. So Jerry Tyndall and I have done three studies over 25 years, um, establishing norms for oral reading fluency in terms of words correct per minute. The most recent study, if you go to the easiest way to find that report is to go to Reading Rockets um, and look up uh, Hasbrook and Tyndall um, or oral reading fluency norms and Reading Rockets has a link to the study, which itself is a little bit hard to find. It's at a University of Oregon website, and um, but it is available. It's a public document. And so that might be a way to keep people um, up to date on this information. Reading Rockets has a couple of versions of papers that I've written around uh, reading fluency. Perfect. I bet we could put that in the links. I did. Okay. I just, yeah. I just Thank put it in you. the chat, but Very I good. would add it to your link page, Jen. Okay. All right. At the bottom. All right. You and I put up there to my, uh, on this last slide, my Twitter handle. And I hope those of you who uh, are on Twitter will connect with me to continue this conversation because that's a place where if I didn't get a chance to answer your question, I will answer your question on, on Twitter for sure. And we, I can do it uh, privately if you don't want a, a public answer. So Julie, I think you were going to yep. talk about some Save upcoming the events. Yeah. Yep. We have two, I believe. The first one is Denise Ide. This will be low cost, not no cost, but um, she's very practical, especially in the phoneme awareness phonics space. So please join us and the registration is not quite open, but I believe that if you're on our mailing list and if you registered, you'll probably be put on our mailing list. So you will get first chance to register for this. So we will send that out and then ta-da, Dr. Tim Shanahan will kick us off in the fall. And we're going to talk about, yes, the science of reading levels. Hmm, I wonder what the science of reading levels is. So this will be great. This is gonna be Bye great. Out. Um, if you so like what we do, we are, we would be honored um, because we are completely unpaid. If you might want to contribute to Read Washington, we are a nonprofit and we do have a button and even $5, any amount helps us continue to do what we're doing. It costs to have Zoom, it costs to have uh, what's our mail, Amy? What do we do for our mail? How we send things mail, out. Email, mail, right? mail. All of those things cost us money. So, um, you know, we don't like asking for money, but we do feel like um, maybe some people might want to contribute. So that is there for you. But mostly we want to leave you with um, good feelings and a way to march on and, you know, 
help others learn the science of reading and make sure that all kids learn to read. So again, together, we can prevent the unnecessary pain of reading failure. We really can. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone.